Ladies and gentlemen, this is your daddy. That's right, your daddy, Bart Coppens. Successful butterfly and moth entrepreneur and breeder of the most exquisitely rare species. Tips Fedora. But today I have to come clean about a big fat lie that I've been telling on YouTube. Because often I project an image of success. I like to brag about my success, as any normal human being, to be honest. Have I not been successful? Yeah, I have. In fact, we had some pretty damn rare and exquisite species of moths on my channel that are very hard to get in the hobby. Such as the Rostildia ericina. Do you remember that video where we raised that one moth from French Guiana? Yeah, that is pretty hard to get species. Or how about the legendary pink spirit moth, the Actias rhodopneuma? Well, that, believe me, that's not a species that the average breeder will be able to obtain most of the time. And then I have awesome species like these, which are pretty hard to breed for a beginner. So I am not unsuccessful. But let me guys tell you a secret. I fail a lot. Behind the scenes, there is failure. Moths are honestly not very easy pets to keep in captivity. No matter if you are a beginner or if you are an experienced breeder, you are inevitably going to fail at some point. You are going to struggle with some difficult to breed species. And you will think to yourself, damn, I'm such a newbie, how could I improve? And it's not that I am a liar, it's not that I deny making mistakes, it's just that I don't like to show them off on YouTube. It's not very nice content to watch me raise a species and see me fail and see all the animals die, but it happens. However, in this episode is about the bloopers, behind the scenes, the mistakes and the failures that you usually do not get to see on my channel. This is Bart Coppens, the YouTube episode, Failures, Regrets and Mistakes. Let's go. Hey guys, do you hear a sound? Aha, shout out to Mr. Daniel Ambul, I hope I pronounced your name right. Those of you who search for insects on YouTube are probably familiar with his channel. If you aren't, go check it out. The biggest caterpillars I have ever seen came from the genus Gonometa, which are leopard moths from Africa. Remember the Gonometa Nisa that were on my channel a few years ago? They were spectacular and the longest caterpillars I have ever seen so far, measuring over 21 centimeters in some cases. In Africa there are many Gonometa species available and some of them have caterpillars bigger than any Saturnidae moth I have seen so far, in terms of length that is not weight. Recently I was watching Mr. Daniel Ambul's channel. If you're watching, you have a wonderful channel by the way, big ups. I saw that he filmed a giant in the wild, Gonometa Titan, and had even bigger caterpillars, and they have even bigger caterpillars than the Nisa I raised myself. Wow, that is spectacular. So I called my contacts in Africa because I was inspired to breed that species. I was like, hello, Africa, can you sell me some eggs of that species? And they were like, sure, we will send you some. And guess what? I managed to obtain the eggs of the Gonometa Titan. However, what happened shortly after was nothing short of a disaster. Let's play it. I have contacts in Africa that sent me eggs when I asked for them because I wanted to film them too. And so I received them. In the beginning, the caterpillars were growing reasonably well without much issues. Although the eggs did have somewhat of a low hatching rate. I did manage to raise the Gonometa Titan for several instars up until instar Number five out of the six that I think these have in total. These caterpillars have dangerous, sharp and even mildly urticating spines that hurt a lot. 
so please be careful with them. I'm experienced with raising Honometa species, so I didn't expect much to go wrong, but eventually, it fortunately, it did. Then, when the caterpillars were further in their final instar, they suffered an anal prolapse. Anal prolapse is in caterpillars uh, a disease caused by either insecticides or a virus, and it causes the anus and intestines to be inverted and protrude, eventually killing the larva. I suspect it was perhaps a virus and not the insecticide, but you never know what farmers are spraying in my area nowadays. Sadly, all the caterpillars died from this disease, only for me to be left with nothing in the end. Rest in peace. That sucks. Maybe next time I will try and succeed and make a moth cycles of some cool Gonometa species. Rest in peace, Gonometa Titan. That sucks. I would have loved to have those on my channel. Maybe some other time in the future, I guess. So what went wrong? I think it was a combination of obtaining this species very early in the year. So early that there were no good host plants available yet. You see, early in the year, in spring, when the trees are budding and the leaves are very young, the young leaves are uh, often very rich in, well, you can call them toxins, phytochemicals that protect the fresh uh, young leaves. And for some reason, some species struggle to feed on them. I think that's why these species struggled from the very beginning. I obtained them so early in spring, I had to feed them poor quality leaf and the good host plants were not available yet. However, some of the caterpillars that did grow big and later into the season, unfortunately also contacted the disease. So it was a combination of two factors, obtaining them too early and having no suitable host plant and having the bad luck of contacting a disease. It sucks, but caterpillars can be very sensitive to diseases in captivity. <sighs> well, I really hope I will be able to obtain this species again sometime and breed it. But that is not all. There have been more species that I failed with this very year. It's embarrassing, I know. Behind the scenes, like I said, there is a lot of failure. And this year I had the idea of making a double Moth Cycles episode with two species in one video. And I was going to do it about two species of Molipa. Let's play the video. Molipa is a genus of moths with over 30 species as far as I know. From the Emperor Moth or the Saturnidae family. Amazing about the Molipa are their highly toxic but brightly colored larva. And in the South American rainforest, many Molipa species without a name are waiting to be discovered by entomologists. And so I got the idea to breed not one, but two species on this channel. I started with the Molipa similia, a species with brightly colored fluorescent yellow larva. They started out pretty well and slowly but surely developed into bigger and bigger caterpillars. Generally speaking, Molipa caterpillars are pretty easy to raise if you keep them a little bit humid but ventilated on plants such as bramble, oak, sweet gum or willow. I raised them in the past but never filmed them for YouTube because in the past I wasn't that serious about YouTube. But these guys disagreed I guess. I did get them to the final instar. Look at their amazing colors. But then sadly they started to die from an infection. And eventually this disease started killing all of my caterpillars until I had no individuals left. How sad, man. I didn't get one, but actually two species of Molipa. My idea was to make a special episode of Moth Cycles for you in which I was breeding two species at the same time and show you their life cycles. A pretty amazing idea. It would have been a really cool episode. Unfortunately, those plants failed pretty hard when I failed to raise not one, but managed to do badly with both species. The baby caterpillars of this species started out well, honestly. They looked healthy and plump, and I was happy for that. As they grew bigger and bigger, they approached the final instars. But then the caterpillars became diseased and started to die, slowly, one by one. How sad. 
So that means I didn't fail with just one, but two Molipa pieces at once. Ouch, that hurts, man. I still want a Molipa life cycle on my channel someday. So I didn't just fail with one, I failed with two species of the same genus of moth. That's pretty embarrassing. I'm not sure what happened, but both species seemed to struggle from the very beginning. Maybe it was the fact I didn't like sweet gum or liquid amber. Maybe it's an unsuitable host plant for Molipa. I don't know, they seemed to uh, like it in the beginning, but later, when they grew bigger, they started to struggle. It could also be that when one of the species got diseased, they got cross-infected. Both species being from the genus Molipa means that they are both susceptible to similar types of diseases. And it could be that the one species becoming infected could have spread to the second species, killing both of them in the process. Oh, it's, pretty <coughs> it's pretty embarrassing. It sucks. And it is one of the species that I officially failed to breed this year. So there is not going to be a moth cycles of the Molipa this year, unfortunately. Otherwise, you would have seen it on my channel. Um, now, I, I, don't, I, uh, I don't really have a successful uh, life cycle of a Molipa on my channel yet. So that's something to work on. But there was a little bit good news. One of all the caterpillars I had made it to a cocoon. So I ended up with one cocoon. And that one cocoon later still turned into a moth. Yeah, that's right. So I do have some footage of one Molipa specimen. <laughs> Let's play it. Yes, that's right. This moth is the only one that survived. The only one. All the other caterpillars died from a virus, but one of them made it to a moth and made a cocoon. So technically it's not 100% a failure, just like 99%. Still, breeding insects and only having one moth as a result is pretty bad. Molipa is an amazing, small type of Saturnidae. There are so many species of them in so many colors. And I hope someday I will have a serious video about them. Species number three I tried to breed this year, but I failed to raise. The Robin Moth. Hyalophora cacropia. I have been breeding moths for over 10 years, but I still fail to breed this one, unfortunately. I don't know what it is with the robin moth, but for some reason, each time I try to raise this insect, I fail. And I'm not sure why that is, because I've spoken to many breeders who raise it, and they tell me it isn't even that much of a difficult species. So clearly I must be doing something fundamentally very wrong. If you are a breeder of the robin moth, please let me know in the comments some tips. And it's pretty strange because I am uh, a more than average experienced breeder. I have probably raised over 200 species of moths. That's an impressive amount. But still, I always fail to breed a robin moth. While it is a somewhat common and to some people easy to raise species, so I don't understand why is it so difficult for me. I still want a life cycle of this insect on my channel. It's the, probably the biggest moth in the United States and I don't know, they, they really don't like the conditions that I give them. I tried them on birch tree, on sweet gum, on oak tree. Every time it results in a failure and it's kind of annoying to be honest. I've been breeding moths for over 10 years, but I still fail to breed this one, unfortunately. Which is crazy, because all my friends tell me this species is easy to breed. But I consistently, consistently fail to breed them, and I'm not exactly sure why. But in the final instars, my caterpillars always get sick. I guess this is proof that I am not a flawless breeder that can breed everything he wants to yet. And I need much more experience to grow. The good news is I'm a very young man with a very long lifetime ahead of him, which is enough time to master all the species eventually, 
It's trial and error and a lot of practice, my friends. Anyways, behind the scenes this year I tried again and managed to get the caterpillars to the final instar. Damn, I was so close but then they got diseased. And then there was no turning point back. Rest in peace. In fact, let me show you a video from years ago where I talk about the failures and mistakes on my channel. And one of the things I mention is the robin moth. Because I fail to raise it. Let's play the clip. Now for number 10. Number 10 is a species that we all know. It's actually a, a rather common one from North America. It's Hyalophora kegropia. Or I should say Hyalophora kegropia. It's the robin moth. And some of you may be surprised because that's a really common species that's really commonly available in the hobby and yeah it's true uh, I agree they're really beautiful I would like to breed them I've tried over four times to breed this species I had so many pairings I had so many eggs but for some reason I just really failed to raise them to the cocoon stage I don't get what I'm doing wrong I do know that the caterpillars, they need a lot of ventilation. Like if you put them in plastic boxes, they'll literally die. You cannot raise these in plastic boxes. They need to be very, very well ventilated. This is a well-known fact. Despite having access to all this knowledge, I still cannot raise them for the life of me. It's really my, my nemesis species, the robin moth. And this year, I, I, just, I just ordered 50 eggs of them. So I'm gonna go try again this year and I'll probably fail. I hope not, I'm gonna do my best really, uh, I'm gonna try and sleeve them on my apple tree. But yeah, the robin moth is really one of, one of those species I just, I just cannot seem to get right, whatever I try. So if, you, if you've bred them, then comment some tips for me. Because actually there are a lot of breeders that have bred these species and maybe they know some, something that I don't. Uh, well, thanks for watching. And I just want to say all the species I've mentioned in this video, I have the sources to get eggs from all of them. So I'm going to go ahead and try again and again every year until I succeed and until I can show some to my viewers. Alright, let's wait until the noise is gone. Because I also love to share them, my success with all of you. Ah, <sighs> Yeah, that's a bit painful, isn't it? That's a bit sad. I am not discouraged though, this hobby is also a lot of trial and error, believe it or not. Um, moral of the story is don't give up if you struggle. If I fail with a species, I am bummed out, I am disappointment, disappointed. Disappointment is pretty normal and very human to feel, but it shouldn't uh, permanently discourage you. It is uh, only vast perseverance that will make you a successful breeder. And when I fail, I see it also as a learning moment. I change my setup and I try something new next time. And most of the time that works. Not yet with the robin moth, but maybe it will too someday. Failure number four. Failure number four. Anterea Montezuma. Anterea Montezuma is a pretty rare species of silk moth from Mexico. In fact, it's an endemic species from Mexico. And it belongs to uh, the American group of Anterea moths that include Godmani, Polyphemus and Oculea. It's a pretty uh, hard to breed and hard to obtain insect. But I was lucky enough to obtain eggs of these moths. <sighs> pretty awesome, right? I was psyched to be able to breed this amazing rarity. However, the outcome was disappointing. Let's play the clip. Anterea Montezuma. Anterea Montezuma is a little bit rare. It's a species from Mexico that belongs to the American species group of Anterea moths that include Godmani, Polyphemus, Oculea, and perhaps some other undescribed species that I suspect could exist. The caterpillars have lovely shiny iridescent purple patches on their body. Absolutely beautiful. 
I received eggs of these and placed them on oak tree, which is their natural host plant. And they seemed to develop normally at first. And then I got them to the amazing third instar. But after that, unfortunately, they became diseased and died. <sighs> failure number five that I'm going to share with y'all today is uh, also an embarrassing failure. It is about the Anterea Helferi. Are you guys familiar with Anterea Helferi? It's embarrassing because this piece is should have been really easy to breed, according to other breeders. Uh, but I failed. So I failed with uh, a newbie species. Yikes. It happens. It's a very beautiful species. I've shown it on my channel before, but my idea was once again to make a Moth Cycles episode, showing you the life cycle of this insect in captivity. But uh, what happened was kind of gross. Let's play the clip. Anterea helferi is a beautiful species of silk moth from Asia. Being the lucky dude that I am, I managed to obtain some eggs of these helferi. At first the caterpillars appear to grow well on sweet gum or liquid amber. This species should not be that hard. Progress seemed reasonable until a certain point. Until fate struck, the caterpillars became diseased and eventually died, unfortunately. Rest in peace, Anterea Helferi. I failed to breed you. Oof, too bad. I've had this species before, but I hadn't filmed their entire life cycle yet. So I wanted to do it for YouTube, but I just, I guess it isn't happening this time. Too bad. Failure, it happens sometimes. So there you go. I failed to raise the Anterea Helferi 2 this year. Now, it's very painful if a Moth Cycles episode fails. It's already painful if I am trying to breed a species and the species ends up dying. It's painful because I like my insects. I want them to survive. I give them a lot of passion. I give them care, love, labor, emotionally and physically. I am working for these animals nonstop. And it hurts when they die or don't, don't make it. It hurts, it does. <sighs> but it's extra painful if it's a Moth Cycles episode. I don't know if you guys have seen my Moth Cycles series. It's a special video series on my channel in which I film the life cycle of a moth from egg to adult. And it's a very, very, um, well, time consuming series to make. If I want to make a Moth Cycles episode, I have to wake up every day uh, a bit earlier just to film the insect every day. I document their growth. Because if you want to show the whole life cycle, you have to show how the caterpillars are growing. And it's basically every day um, a couple of hours of filming. That's why I cannot make many episodes of this series. I think I can, um, the maximum is like five to 10 episodes per year. Because for following the life cycle of so many species at the same time, it uh, adds a lot of, you know, a lot of work on top of the breeding. The breeding is already a lot of work, but vlogging yourself while you are breeding the insects, my God. A lot of people tell me YouTube is easy. Oh, you're being an influencer. You're an influencer. You make videos for a living. Don't complain. Okay, I understand it's, it's comfortable to be creative and do stuff that you love. But don't tell me it's easy because I will beat you. That makes me angry. It's really hard. And if a species dies that I'm making a Moth Cycles episode about, please understand this is months of filming, months of work down the drain. Me filming the life cycle of these tiny animals every day, only for me to end up deleting the video. And that happens behind the scenes. In fact, all of the five failures I shared with you today are failed Moth Cycles episode. That's right, they are failed episodes of Moth Cycles that did not end up being released on my channel. This is why I have footage of their life cycle and then miserably failing. So you should understand that Second of all, I uh, want to tell you something about failure. Failure is pretty normal in this hobby. And lately I realized that online I have been projecting an unrealistic image 
of success. And I want to correct that image. I am perhaps one of the most well-known moth breeders online. Maybe I could be even as arrogant as to say I am one of the most successful moth breeders online. Am I the best, most skilled breeder? I don't think so. But when I say successful, I talk about exposure being well known. I am one of the most successful moth breeders, it's true. Not the most skilled one, but perhaps the most well known one online. With the biggest representation for the hobby. Right? That is one way to measure success. I mean, you could measure success in many ways when it comes to money, fame, whatever. Uh, I have a lot to learn. Uh, as you can see, I clearly have a lot of failures to work on. I'm very young and uh, it will take me many, many, many more years to become a real moth master. So I acknowledge that I am not the best, most skilled moth breeder in the world. But when I say I'm the most successful one, I mean that I am the one with the most exposure online. Hey, can you deny that? That's true, right? There's no other channels, no other websites that have as much attention as I do with my moths. Despite a lot of moth breeders attempting to get attention, but failing. I uh, hope that doesn't sound arrogant, but it's clearly an observation. I'm not saying that the other people suck and that I am the best. I'm very supportive and have always been very supportive of every other hobbyist in this hobby. It's just that uh, it's very hard to get attention with this hobby. And clearly, I somehow manage, which is also a talent, right? But what I'm trying to say is uh, the reason I have this is because I can project an image of being successful. But I want you guys to know this is not a realistic expectation to have. And today I wanted to share my failures with you because it is important for you to understand that failure is pretty normal in this hobby. And don't let it discourage you because everybody fails, including me. And yeah. Because uh, a lot of people, I think, when they watch my channel, they become, you know, inspired to do the things that I do. They want to copy it. They want to breed moths themselves. That's fine. That's my goal. I want to encourage more people to study these wonderful animals. Um, but the thing is, I also don't want to make other people feel bad or so unrealistic expectations. I just end up not sharing many of my mistakes online. Now, some of you may ask me, Bart, why is that? Why don't you share your mistakes with your followers? Are you a liar? Are you pretending to be an expert while you are really not? No, it's not that. I have several reasons for that. First of all, you have to understand that yes, YouTube is about projecting an image, but uh, I also think it's pretty uh, off-putting and depressing content. If I am trying to raise a moth of a certain species and you follow its whole life cycle and it ends up dying, who wants to go on YouTube to see animals die? That's suppressing, isn't it? That's not going to inspire people, it's going to scare people away, it's going to make them unsubscribe. People don't want to see me fail and kill several species of insects. That's just how it is. And of course, there is also an element uh, about my image it's not like I am trying to uh, sell a lie of being ultra successful and uh, if that was true I wouldn't make this video. I wouldn't have shared my failures with all of you if I really wanted to, to live a fake successful life. Like, oh, he is Bart Coppens, he can breed everything without failure. It's not that, but I also think that um, oversharing oversharing your failures it's not going to do uh, any good for your reputation and I am protective of that let's be honest if I overshare too much of my failures uh, I think I my the, the opinion people have of me will definitely go down and then there's also the element of the fact that I am very representative of this hobby as a whole Lots of people don't even know that moth breeding is a thing and that it exists. And then they find my channel and they're like, wow, there's actually people who breed moths. Yeah, we exist. We are out there. And when they see my channel and it's like the 
content of me killing my caterpillars and them dying from diseases and failure and depressing stuff that's not inspiring is going to give the hobby a bad name. Truth is, uh, these animals are, require very specialist care. There is a very hard learning curve. You will fail. If you are a beginner in this hobby, expect you fail a lot before you have a little bit of success. It is that simple. It is a very difficult hobby, I will admit it. And um, today I just wanted to open up about the fact that, yes, everybody fails. I feel too. I am, not, I am not as great as I pretend to be on YouTube. I'm honestly not. I am more experienced than average, but I am not like the moth master. <laughs> not yet. I want to be. I aspire to be. But I am not yet. That would be very arrogant for me to claim that I am the best breeder. I am really not. I know so many breeders who have bred like 10 times more species than I did. I am only 27 years old. I know breeders who are who have been breeding moths for 50 years. For longer than I have been alive. Yeah, understand that. I am nothing. I am nothing. I am I am compared to the real professionals in this hobby, I am but a speck of dust, a grain of sand, worthless. And it's it is a lot of trial and error. And what is very important that if you fail is that you don't let it discourage you, but that you learn from your mistake, that you think, what could I do better next time? There's a lot of species that uh, I fail to breed the first and second, or maybe even the tenth time. But you keep going and going, and someday you will understand, like, this is the conditions this insect needs, and you will improve, and then you will succeed and you will win. And that's how we do it. Is that a weird thing to say? Is it weird that I am making a video about my YouTube failures and my YouTube regrets? Well, here you have it. It's official. Some of my failures. Some of my insects that did not survive and did not make it. Do you like it? Let me know in the comments. Last but not least, I am going to share some more failures and bloopers with all of you today. Because we have some behind the scenes cringe. I think the first that comes to mind is called the intro. The intro failure. What was that about? Well, a long time ago I was working a shitty job in a DHL warehouse. Yeah, it's true, I worked in a warehouse for like three years. Like lifting heavy boxes, picking orders. I don't want to make fun of people who do this kind of work, because I've done it for years. I understand how important it is. And, um, but let's be honest, it's not the most rewarding type of work. You do it because it pays the bills, but it's also very ungrateful and soul-crushing work. It was a shitty job, let's be honest, it was a very shitty job, and I'm glad that I am not doing that job right now. <sighs> Although if financial times become harder, I could be forced to do it again. Right now the channel is doing so well, I don't have to do that for a while. I have uh, made more money than the minimum wage the past three months. So that's a really good thing. But uh, my income fluctuates because my channel is small and demonetized. So sometimes there are months that I only make a few hundred dollars. Sometimes there are months that I make a few thousand dollars. And um, the highs and the lows are very difficult to live with. Anyway, I was working this job and I had this colleague and it was a few years ago, my channel was kind of smallish. I think I had like 5,000 subscribers. And then I made a terrible mistake of um, showing my channel to my colleagues. I was like, look, I have a successful YouTube channel. I was kind of bragging a little bit and showing it off. And uh, they were impressed. However, what happened shortly after was, was nothing short of cringe. Pure and utter cringe. Turns out one of my colleagues was a graphic designer, or whatever he called it. And after seeing my channel, he got really thirsty and pushy. Because he said he wanted to make content for my video. And then uh, he started to take a look at my channel. And he was like, oh dude, you need a, you need a good intro for your channel. Huh? You're, you don't have an intro, and uh, you should improve that. And he really started pressuring me into that. 
So he's wondering, what is his motivation for, for him to do so? And later it became clear, because he wanted me to pay him to make an intro for my channel. And I honestly didn't want this, you know? Because um, it's my channel. I like to do uh, the stuff myself that I upload on my channel. I don't really like to outsource my work and let other people make animations or intros for me. Maybe that sounds silly and uh, maybe I should change my mind on that. But the thing is, he was really manipulative about it, you know. He, is, he has shared his life story about how he was like this field artist slash graphic designer and how uh, I should hire him to make an intro for my channel. So, you know, one thing that people don't know about me is that I have a hard time saying no to people. It's one of my character flaws. If you put a lot of social pressure on me and uh, manipulate me, there's a chance that I will say yes, and I will agree to things that uh, I actually am not comfortable with. And unfortunately, that's what happened. So I agreed to make the guy, to let the guy make an intro for me. Oh God. And the intro was absolutely terrible. Let's, <laughs> let's play the intro. Everything changes. I paid $50 for this crap. $50. I paid $50 for that. This guy managed to socially pressure me into paying him for that ridiculous intro. And later he was offended because I didn't use his intro in my videos. He was following my channel and was like, Whoa, Bart, I see your new videos, but you're not using my intro. Why? Well, I didn't have the guts to tell him it was terrible. But it was terrible. Let's be honest. Don't you guys agree it's a terrible intro? If you think that's a cool intro, you have no taste. You have very poor taste. But uh, it was a valuable lesson. And the valuable lesson that I learned today is one. If you are successful online, don't brag about it, okay? If you are a successful YouTuber or influencer or whatever, don't brag about it at work, in your private life. Because what I learned that day is it is not going to attract people who are impressed with what you do. It's not going to give you more followers. It's going to attract parasites and bloodsuckers who want to take advantage of you. Now, this is a few years ago, I was more shy. Today I am more assertive, I am more comfortable with rejecting people and saying no, I don't want to collaborate with you. But back then, this guy, he managed to socially pressure me. And I basically paid him a lot of cash for something I didn't want, I didn't need. And it was very poor in quality and I never even had the balls to say that the quality was very low and stupid. Is it a big issue? No, it is years ago. It is years ago and it's only $50. It's still just one of those embarrassing and awkward moments that happened behind the scenes. And that's what this episode is about. It's about the outtakes, my failures and my regrets. Apart from failing to breed certain types of moss, I also sometimes fail to make certain types of videos that I want. You know what happens very often? I make a video, I upload it to YouTube, and then I change my mind. And then I'm like, this is not really the content that I like. I want to delete it from my channel and I never publish it. And uh, this channel has a lot of videos. I have over a, a thousand videos on this channel. It's, I'm a compulsive uploader. That's why the channel is successful probably. But uh, let me show you Perhaps one of the more embarrassing videos that I deleted. Here, let's play it. It was an episode of Bart Vlogs. Psst. Hey, it is me, Bart Coppens. And I came here with a message. 
passage. I love you. I love you. Listen, my name is Bart Coppens and I'm a pretty popular guy. No matter what my self-esteem thinks about me, that's a fact that's hard to deny. I mainly have the internet to blame for that. But I didn't always used to be popular, you know. Because when I was younger, not so long ago, I didn't really have that much friends or people who supported me in general. Now why is that? Well, when I was younger, I was a very proud guy, a very stubborn one. For some reason I always found it hard to admit that I cared about people. Why this is, I don't really know. It's a complex psychological thing. I guess it made me feel vulnerable. But the biggest life lesson that I've learned that I can share with you is that if you like someone, tell them that you love them. And that doesn't have to be romantically, although it can be. It's not only about relationships. It's also about your friends. It's about your family. You know, there's a lot of people who depend on each other in, uh, in, in life, who can't really go, who can't really function without each other. But still they never tell each other explicitly that they are appreciated. And I used to be very arrogant and too prideful. I was ashamed. I was ashamed of telling people that I cared about them. For those who are watching my channel and who know me from my teenage years, which is probably no one, because most people in that time hated me. And for good reasons, because I was arrogant. I never acknowledged anything or anyone. I never acknowledged the fact that I appreciated someone or someone's friendship. In fact, I grew resentful over it. I had a weird psychological complex that made me hate the people that cared about me because it made me feel vulnerable. You know what? Today I'm completely over it. I am over it. I'm not like that anymore. I consider that one of my best character developments. It's one of the things that made me grow from a bitter, misanthropic teenager into an adult man who can say with confidence I love you. I love you, and I'm not ashamed of saying it. And I encourage everyone who is watching this channel to say it. Let people know that they are appreciated, if you genuinely appreciate them. Don't be like me. 
and don't reject people's advances don't reject people's friendship just because you're afraid of acknowledging it exists don't be afraid to acknowledge you care about someone I think a lot of people go through life loving each other but never explicitly stating it now, of course it's not only about how you state it it's not about the empty words it's about showing it it's about showing appreciation not only uttering the words I like you but it's also making a gesture that you like them am I an internet guru? no am I an online relationship coach? no I am Bart Coppens, the weird stupid guy who breeds moths on the internet that's what I do, I breed moths and I show them off that's my whole shtick I'm a one trick pony but sometimes, in rare occasions, I feel like getting things off my chest. And it is YouTube who helped me get over this fear. Believe it or not, it was the unconditional support and emotional engagement of all the people who followed me online that culminated into me developing many friendships with these people. It started online, but I actually made many friends in real life through this very channel. And that's eventually what took me out of my shell. Because I realized without these people I am nothing. So it makes no sense to be prideful. It makes no sense to have an ego. Because my comp accomplishments are not just my own accomplishments. They're enabled. They're given to me. By people like you. Who supported me. And for that I thank you. And I don't only thank you. For clicking on my videos. And watching them. I thank you for allowing me to say these words I love you because that is because of you see ya okay guys tell me honestly what did you think of that video did you like it or not personally I didn't really like it and this is one of the cringy outtakes slash mistakes slash bloopers I guess it's not really a blooper, because it was just a full-blown video I was about to upload, but... It really doesn't fit my channel, I don't know, I was in a strange mood that day, I didn't know why I, why I made that video. Now, it's, it's, not, it's not new for me to talk about things like... Mental health, and... I don't know, interpersonal relationships. I've made a video before about... Being emotionally vulnerable, or weak and how to deal with, I don't know, feeling of be the feeling of being unaccomplished or feeling worthless. Sometimes I do come out and talk about mental health issues and stuff like that. I don't know why I have that habit. My channel was originally about butterflies and moths. But sometimes I cannot help to come online to share my opinion about super random stuff. But I didn't really uh, like this video because it, it felt kind of intrusive. Uh, somehow it feels a bit manipulative, and I, I don't know, the vibe was just off. I felt like some fucking love guru or something. <laughs> I don't want to be this weird YouTube love guru. I'm just a guy who breeds moths. And I also felt that the point that I made was a bit, bit poorly worded. And it's a bit shallow, you know. That basically the clue of the video is that you should, people, should tell people that you love them and appreciate them. And that's still something I agree with. You should... The, let the people that you love and appreciate, you should let them know that you, that you appreciate them. Because someday it will be too late and you will regret never having said that you love them. But it's a bit of a shallow message. It's like saying, racism is bad, violence is bad, don't steal, don't sexually assault people. I mean, it's a very, very obvious thing to say, like, oh, 
Love your loved ones. Love thy neighbor. I mean, it's it's not it's not a bad it's not a bad message, but it is a very shallow and very shallow and obvious kind of thing that most people will agree upon. You know, when 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 I like to share some of my wisdom with my viewers, it is often something unique that I have learned from life experience and. I want to share this experience with my viewers so maybe they can learn from it just like me. When, my, when I make a mistake in life, when there's drama in my life and I learn from it, I don't share the drama, but I do share the lessons I have learned from the drama. Most of the things I talk about on YouTube indirectly relate back to me, uh, my personal problems. Uh, that being said, in this case it was, I don't know, uh, just it felt just a little bit shallow and preachy, like who am I to tell people who to love and in what way? I agree, I still agree that in our society there is a problem. We don't show people appreciation enough, our closest friends, or family, uh, or parents. Sometimes we fail to acknowledge the fact how much they are appreciated and they feel underappreciated and undervalued. That's a message I can get into. But just to come out on YouTube and say, well, you should tell people that you love them more. I don't know. It just felt kind of weird, intrusive. And I ended up deleting the video. And here's a fun fact. I have, I have over, I think it's over 15 of these kinds of videos that I ended up not uploading or deleting. Maybe I will keep them as bloopers or behind the scenes awkwardness, something like that, I guess. That was just one of the videos. I want to share with you. Well, that was Bart Coppens with some of the regrets, the failures, the mistakes, the awkward things that happen behind the scenes. Clearly, some of the outtakes that we have are most I feel to breed, failed life cycles that I never upload, yet I worked on for months. It's pretty bitter and disappointing, but it happens. You know, my content is not, not easy to make. If I had to name one more mistake, it is the way I used to handle dangerous animals. There's actually a video of me handling a red bag spider on this channel. It didn't get that much views, but it's the Latrodectus hasselti, uh, one of the most venomous spiders in the world from Australia. Thankfully, these animals are very docile and not aggressive, so the chance of them biting is extremely small. But handling them is definitely not recommended. What's funny is that handling these animals in the Netherlands is even more dangerous than handling them in Australia. Because in Australia, if you get bitten by a deadly spider, uh, most hospitals have antivenom available, which will uh, reduce the damage of the venom, right? It will uh, decrease the harm. But in the Netherlands, we don't have antivenom for redback spiders or species like that. In Australia they are native, so the hospital can give you the treatment. In the Netherlands, if you are bitten by, uh, I don't know, a redback spider, they would have to fly the antivenom probably from Australia, which would take 24 to 48 hours for it to arrive, which could already be too late. I used to be pretty foolish. Maybe I was inspired by channels like Brave Wilderness. I do have a little bit of regret hand of handling some of the, the dangerous animals on this channel. There's also a video where I was handling Lonomia caterpillars. I don't know if you guys have seen that video or if you remember it. Uh, there were like these swarm of caterpillars that are sitting on my hand. And Lonomia caterpillars, I don't know if you guys know them. There's about uh, 22 species of them. Some of them are kind of harmless, and some of them are deadly. Like, if you touch them, you can actually die. <sighs> Game over. The thing is that in literature, it's not very clear which species are harmless and which ones are deadly. The deadly ones are, for example, Lonomia oblica, Lonomia agelus, which are two species in Brazil, and also Peru and other countries. And then there's also harmless species, but there has not been that much research on which species are harmful and what species are harmless. So when I got the eggs of these species, I actually didn't know if they were going to be deadly or not. And I took the gamble. 
Turns out that they were harmless and I didn't die. Yay! But during this video I could have easily died if I made a mistake in judgment. And this is perhaps one of the poorest things that I have done on my channel, which I regret. I am not going to delete the video because I don't believe in deleting my mistakes. I want to archive everything I've done over the years, including the silly and stupid things that we have learned from and moved on from. Plus the video is still getting views. Sorry. I probably wouldn't do something like this again. Uh, it's pretty stupid. Risking your life for views is very dumb. I was aware of the risks. I w I'm not even uneducated. I'm very educated on mods. And still I decided to take the risk. I don't know why. I think it's the Steve Irwin effect. You see people play with dangerous animals and become successful. They get a lot of attention and you're like, yeah, I want to do that. When I started this channel, I was immature. I was irresponsible with my animals. I have very much improved as a breeder and as a person, I hope. I like to think I am. And that's what I would perhaps also name as a failure or a mistake. Why well, it's not really an outtake or a blooper. It's something I would change. I don't fuck with potentially deadly animals anymore, especially not for views. It could give a bad example. There's a lot of young people watching my channel right now and they could be inspired to do the same things that I do. And if you're watching this and you saw that video, guys, I'm gonna tell you honestly, don't play with potentially deadly animals for views. Your life is not worth a few likes. It's absolutely stupid and ridiculous. It's going to end up giving you some backlash. It's going to hurt your professional career. Uh, if you look my, at my channel and you see these videos, it's going to make me look silly and unprofessional. Uh, and I agree with that. It's pretty stupid look. If I see like a snake breeder play with uh, deadly cobras, I'm also like, maybe this guy is not really that professional. And it's the same for me, I shouldn't have done it. Still, I'm not gonna delete the videos. But I do regret making them and I would definitely not make the same videos again in the future. I am open to stinging myself with caterpillars, it happens quite frequently, but I research the species pretty well. And I do draw the line at potentially deadly things, guys. That's insane. Thank you guys for watching my video. This was some of the failures, some of the mistakes. Yes, everybody makes mistakes. Don't be ashamed. And in the future, we're going to be successful again with some cool life cycles. <coughs> Did I just do that? Yes. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching my YouTube series about YouTube. Everybody can become a YouTuber, so let's go get those views. Don't we all just want to be internet famous, making videos in our basement, six figures and revenue? It's so cool to be PewDiePie or Ethan Klein. But YouTube is a fickle bitch, there's no guarantees Next month you might not make shit, no one knows what advertiser friendly now is So just fuck it and make some cool shit Fucking you